to Climate Action News One on One, brought to you by We Don't Have Time. This is the world's largest social media network for climate action. It's also brought to you by A Sustainable Tomorrow, Sweden's leading network for connecting people working with sustainable business and also arranging conferences. My name is Katarina Rolf Stotter Jansson, and I am the host of this show. John Hope Bryant is an American entrepreneur, author, philanthropist, and prominent thought leader. He has founded Operation Hope and has served as an advisor to the last three sitting U.S. presidents. It's a great honor to have us have you with us today here, John Hope Bryant. Honored to be with you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Likewise, of course. Uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic. And what, from your perspective, can we learn from how we are able as individuals, companies, and organizations to set the best, our own good, aside for common good. What can we learn from this uh, in taking on the big climate crisis that we, of course, still have to address? First of all, uh, I want to say hello to all my friends there in Sweden. I know you're broadcasting around the world, but uh, Sweden has a, a very special place in my heart. and. Uh, the Nordic region is a really, in many ways, a role model on so many, uh, in so many areas for the entire world, uh, including sustainability, including uh, happiness and joy, including finding ways to prioritize um, uh, peace. <laughs> um, and we share mutual friends. So please give all, all my colleagues, our mutual colleagues, uh, my love. Um, the the current environment makes your mission in some ways much easier, uh, more difficult in the short term because people are trying to figure out how to survive, how to uh, um, sustain themselves, uh, their own environmental ecosystem in their own homes and their own lives and their businesses. Beyond that. Um, I see this as a bit of a reset. Mm. Um, I think that uh, if you're a spiritual person, as am I, um, you could easily fashion in your mind that a higher power, you know, has been trying to send signals to us for a while that income inequality wasn't sustainable. Please address that. We didn't. Wealth inequality wasn't sustainable. Please address that. We didn't. Uh, racial divisions were getting worse uh, since, you know, probably more intense any time since World War II, the era of World War II, uh, where my Jewish friends and others were persecuted and prosecuted un unjustly uh, and killed. Um, please address those racial issues. We didn't. Political divisions, uh, building, bridge building bridges had been overtaken by building walls. Um, uh, both uh, psychological and physical and spiritual walls, I'm sorry, political walls, but also physical walls. Um, you know, that's not a house divided cannot stand. Please address that. We didn't, just made it worse. Um, oh, by the way, this is globally. This is not a U.S. Well, phenomenon. It's not a, this, these are global themes. Um, and I think probably the worst is, hey, you, uh, you all are, share the same small planet. And, um, you know, uh, it needs to be taken care of. Please do that. And, you know, you look, people look at this situation of, of climate uh, change and environmental sustainability and global warming, and they, they look out, you know, 100, 200, 300 years ago, oh, we'll fix that down the road. And what you were hearing in uh, the last, you know, three or four years, uh, sort of, you know, and I think the, it got more intense in the last three or four months before uh, COVID-19 hit, you're hearing that we had to do something like you start seeing transracial changes of the melting of uh, the Arctic caps and things like that in, you know, you're talking about five years time, 10 years time, 20 years time in our lifetime, uh, you start seeing, um, almost permanent transformations of our landscape that will uh, raise water levels, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, it starts to seem a little doomsday-ish in the sense that you couldn't get your leaders to focus, not yours, all of our leaders, 
to focus on this issue. COVID-19 happens and there's no need there's for a speech anymore. There is focus now. Yeah. Yeah, it's global. And, and I think on the other side of this, all of our values will realign around things that are really, really important first. So uh, about leadership, you have written several books um, about leadership. One is, is called, uh, I love the title, Love Leadership the new way to lead in a fear-based world. And this, what we're uh, seeing now is indeed a fear-based world. Um, what is your best advice to leaders when it comes to you know, staying committed? Uh, now we're talking about climate, climate, climate action because that's the theme of, that's the, what we work with primarily in this, in this sure. um, venue. Uh, how do you stay committed in the midst of this craziness and, and also with all this fear going around? Yeah. Well, fear never worked anyway as a, as a business strategy or as a leadership approach. I'm writing another book, sorry, I've written another book called Up From Nothing, which comes out in October. Uh, it'll be my fifth. Um, I'm primarily an entrepreneur and a business leader, uh, but I feel like I need to lead in, lean into thought leadership and try to uh, make the world a better place by getting us to think differently while getting us to think. <laughs> um, Fear is a short-term stimulus. And what people need, what leaders need to understand is if you don't have hope, uh, it, <laughs> hope and love, the world will accept hope and fear. In other words, can you scare people into believing that they'll get what they want, which gives them a false sense of hope by demonizing someone else? by giving them a short-term answer, uh, by winning the battle and losing the war. Uh, and as you'll see over the long arc of history, and I want you to go back literally uh, thousands of years, um, uh, you'll, you'll find that, that these folks never win long-term. Let's look at you know, recent examples of that. Um, uh, Adolf Hitler reigned, uh, if you want to call it that, and for, you know, eight years, everybody thought, oh, my God, this guy's going to run the world. No one can stop him. Well, he died a, a miserable life as a miserable person in a bunker alone. And you can go to Osama bin Laden and you can go to – there's so many of these examples of these authoritarian, uh, hard-nosed leaders, so-called leaders, who had a fear-based approach and they, uh, they, in a short period of time, concentrated – that fear into what appeared to be dominance. But if you go far enough to the North Pole, you end up South. So, but how's, how as a leader do you, do you bring out the more love than fear in, in this situation? Because people are in, in, I see a lot of people are sort of deviating from their commitment when it comes to climate action because they're so fearful of the, the short-term financing of their, their work. How do you, how yeah, do you well, speak this? Well, again, well, the, the first thing I wanted to, to bring out in my, uh, my example is that those who are supposedly successful in fear actually were not successful. That was my, real, my first point is that th it didn't work. They had, they, they had a small arc, and literally every one of them, whatever, whatever fear-based leader you want to, to cite, it all ended in ruin. Literally every one of them, Stalin, I mean, you, you, whichever ones you want to raise. Now let's, let's flip the script and let's talk about sustainable brands, uh, sustainable leaders. Uh, you mentioned President Barack Obama. Uh, I'd argue even with, uh, with uh, challenges to reputation, President Bill Clinton had a sustainable approach to, uh, to, to success. And, and, uh, and I think it was very uh, successful as a result of that. Let's look at uh, moral leaders like uh, President uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, these, are, these are easy examples. But let's look at business brands. I think the, the brands that will survive and thrive on the other end of this are not the ones who are profit taking. You're trying to figure out what they can get, how much they can t take off the table. They were the brands that we, we learned to trust, that we both felt have and had, had and have integrity, who believe in, in what they're doing, who who actually uh, want our families to, 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 to not die sort of eating their product or using their product. Uh, look, Coca-Cola is basically bottled sugar water. There's nothing special about Coca-Cola. The one 
brand of 200 within Coca-Cola's uh, uh, supply chain. But Coca-Cola has made an ex a, a commitment to, for, uh, uh, to renew, uh, all, to reclaim, reclamation of all the water they use to make the product. They, they, this is, they have a foundation that gives back uh, tens of millions of dollars every year, and they're very committed to this. I think that that has helped their reputation around the world. Uh, I think it sustains them as a business, and they're one of the most successful brands in the world. There are tons of examples of companies like this that have done well and done good, done well by doing good, and I think that they'll be able to sustain themselves through this current crisis, and they will see when the, when the dust settles that they actually rose. Um, I, I guess what I'm saying to you is I can't guarantee you that being positive is going to make you a success, but I can absolutely guarantee you that being negative will make you a failure. That, that the alternate approach is not really an approach. The alternate strategy is not really a strategy at all. You will win the battle, but you will lose the war. That was really my point of giving the, the early examples of, of these authoritarian, negative, short-term leaders. It just doesn't work long-term. It doesn't work long-term, and, and it has never worked long-term. It's never. It's, if you want success in your life, that's not the way to get it. A lot, of, a lot of climate activists around the world are now looking at the hope of this being sort of a reset of the economy, that the subsidies that have gone into fossil fuels will now be uh, opted out for, uh, that we will be able to, to single out the companies, to get rid of the companies that are really, really not uh, good for, our, for the future of our children. What do you say about this possibility and how do we, how do we as business leaders and leaders in our, in our companies all over the world sort of facilitate this transition? How do we make sure that when we get the economy back on its feet again, it's not going to be business as usual because business as before COVID was not sustainable in many yeah. aspects. So, so I'm going to surprise you, I think, by my answer. I actually don't think that that's the right approach. Hmm. I don't think that guilt, shame, blame, pointing fingers, um, is going to work at all. It's never worked. That hasn't worked as a strategy either. Um, I think that the way we save the planet, it, I do agree this, this is a reset. I said it earlier. I do think this is going to reset all our values, our virtues, and the other side of this. What do you do about it once it's reset? And I think that what we have to do about it, and it's going to maybe shock your viewers, is to make saving the environment and climate change a business case. Hmm. The minute you insert greed, <laughs> Warren Buffett, one of our most prominent investors uh, in the world, has said, when people are afraid, be greedy. When people are greedy, be afraid. And uh, what I mean by that is, if you can make a business case out of saving the environment, if you can make a business case out of uh, solar highways, as an example, uh, you know, having all this asphalt on the road around the world uh, is not sustainable. But that was what happened in the Industrial Revolution. Having all these cables coming out of the ground, literally with, you know, from light pole to light pole, is not sustainable. But that's what we did in the 20th century. Uh, what happens if we take all that and put it on the ground? This is just one example. Created solar highways. Used the heat to, uh, to, to, to uh, power the, the grid and then plug the houses and businesses into that grid. Um, that would put, if you did that globally, that would put a generation to work, a generation of people, first of all, who have a high school education, uh, who need a job, because a lot of the, the bad decision making is because people want, let's be honest, money. They want a job. And President Bill Clinton once told me it's hard to get somebody to agree to the truth when the lie is paying their paycheck. I'm going to repeat that. It's hard to get somebody to agree to the truth when the lie is paying their paycheck. So you need the truth to pay their paycheck. We've got to stop giving people more out morals and, and, and speeches and, and saying that love is enough. Love's not enough. Love's not even enough in a marriage. You need love and cooperation and communication and, 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 and uh, compromise. Love's not enough in a friendship. It's not love enough in business. We've got to give people more than moral speeches and platitudes. We've got to create a business plan that is sustainable for our world. And by making saving the environment a business case, you, you don't need to beat anybody over the head anymore. You don't need to, to uh, convince anybody. All of a sudden, it's in their enlightened self-interest to, uh, to save the planet. I think that's the way to do it. 
And it is, I think, been proven actually by the history of our world, how we solve problems. And it's possible. Well, let's for sure hope that. We are also struggling with the subsidies that, for instance, the Swedish, go Swedish government is pumping into to fossil, fossil industries. But um, we'll see what happens with, with, with those in, in, in the due course of this, this pandemic and the aftermath. Uh, you have worked a lot with diversity and you've been to Sweden. You were the first keynote speaker at the Sustainable, Com uh, Sustainable Tomorrow Conference five years ago in Bosta. And uh, you know, we are struggling in Sweden and many countries with diversity. Uh, in light of what we need to move further on with sustainable, sustainable business climate action, what words can you give to encourage us to facilitate uh, diversity better in our organizations? Uh, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's the same answer I just gave you in the environment. It's not about guilt or blame or, 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 or morals. Diversity is a business strength. Uh, I was in Saudi Arabia a few years ago. We pulled out because of what happened there recently. We had offices in Saudi. But I was there in Jeddah and speaking to the Chamber of Commerce in Jeddah to all the business elite. And you had ministers from the government there listening to me. And Uh, the issue of, of women is something I wanted to address. And uh, I knew if I addressed it from a moral perspective or whatever, uh, human rights, they would roll their eyes, shut down on me. So I said, look, you, you guys are really interested in your brand, the Saudi Arabia brand. You're really interested in being a world leader. You've paid, uh, you spent a billion dollars for licensing names like the Louvre and Ferrari. So I know you're interested in your reputation. But let me ask you a question. You want to win, okay? You have a fairly small economy. You want to, you want to be a big player in the, in the world economy. Make this very short. You want to win. We have a football team. And I've got, you know, 20 people on my team. And, and it's women, men, and black and white and orange. And, and uh, they're just the best players. They're just the best players. But you only allow men on your team. So you got the best players, but you've only got 10 people on your team. I've got 20. You're well, excluding win? big talent, just, yes. Excuse me? You're excluding talent. You're excluding, the, you're, excluding you're, you're denying your ability to win. You literally, it's math. You literally cannot win when I've got 20 people who are talented on my team and you've got 10 who are talented on yours. You're limiting it based on a, on a false narrative. And when I said that, the light came on. They actually got that. And I think once again, you know, how do you, business, how do, you do business with people in the world if you don't reflect, respect, and understand their values? One of the, the benefits of the U.S. is a lot of challenges here. One of the benefits of the U.S. is it's the only nation in the world with every race of people within its borders. So we trade with the world. And why is the West Coast of the U.S. so vibrant? Because the West Coast trades with Asia. Um, because there's a huge a, a Korean population there, huge Chinese population there. They trade with the people that they, the, for whom they have relationships. Why, are, why do we have huge trade with Nigeria? There's a lot of Nigerians here. And it goes on and goes on and goes on. And so I think that you, you have to understand that life's about relationships. How did I get with you? Not out of the, the, the internet. I got uh, to you through a mutual friend, a relationship. That's the way it works. And if you don't have relationships with people who don't look like you, then you only, you only end up doing business with people who look like you. Now, and I'll, I'll flip that and say this, and this is not related to Sweden at all, of course, because Sweden is an extremely decent place. But I, I, in the southern states here in America, I'll give this example uh, for somebody who was racist last year, I mean, in the last century, eat, that you cannot, you cannot segregate your mind and integrate your pocket. You cannot segregate your heart and integrate your pocket. It, it doesn't work that way. You can't say, I don't like you, uh, black person or Latino or woman or whatever. I don't want to do business with you. you know, don't, don't, don't come in my neighborhood, but then expect me to do business with you and come and buy something from your store. It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, the color of currency in the U.S. is green. <laughs> it's not black or white. It's sure. green. And it spins the same. Mm -hmm. So if you don't respect your customer, they're not going to do business with your company, you're limiting yourself. So I think that women have a unique contribution uh, that, is, that is special. And if we had women, more women decision makers, I think you'd have less friction in the world, as an example. Yeah. I, I think that people agree. would, yeah. I absolutely agree. Thank you for those remarks. Um, the We Don't Have Time platform, uh, the largest social media network in the world for climate action, uh, I work with, with the way we don't have time, obviously, and we have a firm belief in the power of the many. 
And from your perspective, globally, I mean, you travel, not right now, obviously, but you travel a lot and see, meet a lot of people. What would you say, where lies the power of the many? And how could we sort of use that momentum in, in looking at tipping points and, and change makers to facilitate more climate action? What hope do you see in the power of the many of movements right now, globally? I am I'm in, incredibly encouraged. I think that what you're seeing right now with COVID-19, coming back to where we started, this is the power of the many. 40% of the, of the work in the U.S. is done by hourly workers. Nobody really realized that before. Uh, no one even paid any attention to it. And these, were, these are working class people living from paycheck to paycheck. But with all of my friends with a college degree, they're at home. The people who are out on the front line, the, the, uh, the first responders to our sustainability uh, are, are diverse, <laughs> ethnic, low wealth, hourly workers in the masses. They're delivering our packages, they're delivering our groceries, they're keeping the factories open, they're processing all the things that we need to live and ex exist and operate. They're, they're first responders in the hospital, they're the police officers, their, their fire department. I mean, we now realize how much we actually need them. And they have so much control over the sustainability of our, of the world in which we, they are teachers for our children. Uh, we didn't realize that, the, that these, these schools were babysitting our children. Until the kids came home. I think that this is the quiet, loving, beautiful revolution of the masses. This is the, 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 the value of the many. This, and you don't, need to, you don't need to bang on tables. You don't need to pick it. You don't, you don't need to, again, there's no need for anger. There's no need for guilt. This, this, this is enlightened self-interest. We are beginning to realize through this pandemic that we're all in this thing together, that whatever goes around comes around. Um, and, and, and we're all interconnected. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, I, my, my next book is, is about just that, up from nothing, that America is, uh, in most countries in the world, Sweden too, uh, it, it wasn't defined by kings and queens and royalty. It was defined by the least of these God's children who came up from nothing, who built important companies there in Sweden and important companies throughout the Nordic region that, that employed tens of thousands of people, created wealth. Uh, and then they are able to pay taxes that then allow people to be subsidized here in the U.S. It, whatever big company you mentioned, starting with some dr entrepreneur, some dream, some poor person who came through Ellis Island uh, as an immigrant in the 20th century with, with 20 bucks in their pocket, but a dream in their head and, and passion in their heart and really ability to work hard. You know, I was talking to the CEO of Walmart the other day. Well, that was Sam Walton with the pickup truck, a storefront in the high school education, now the largest employer in the world. Uh, I, I think that we are beginning to see uh, how, how much we actually need each other. And, uh, and I think the same will apply to climate change. I think the same applies to sustainability. I think that we are, are I mean, my wealthy friends now, really, now absolutely realize in order for them to stay rich and wealthy, my poor friends need to do better because they can't go buy your groceries, they can't go buy your, your cars, they can't go, can't go to your restaurants when we open restaurants again, they can't travel on your airlines. I mean, you know, literally 70% of this economy in the U.S. and most of the, uh, and I believe it's the case of Sweden too, is consumer spending. I, I, every I know every developed country in the world, 70, 60, 70% of the GDP is consumer spending. That's the average person, that's not the wealthy. So would you say that this, as painful as it is, and, and loss of life, and, and loss of finances, and everything, would you say this is a wake-up call for the planet, for the for the humanity? Absolutely, and is 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 you know my stock portfolio is taking a hit like everybody else's, and I chose by the way not to sell when I took a hit. One, why why sell and lock in your losses? Um, but two, if you really believe, if you really believe, then you have to understand that what goes up will come down, and what comes down. If we get our business plan right, we'll go up. So unless the world just is coming to an end, what will happen is what always happens and is that life is cyclical. We go through these, 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 uh, these peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. And then your job, our job is to find a way to be part of the solution and ride the way back up. 
And as that, as that happens, your equities will increase. Your stock values will increase. Your job opportunities will increase. Our opportunities for social change will increase. Our opportunities to do good will increase. And you're going to have the rise of new entrepreneurs and new billionaires and new uh, capitalists who have been hurt, stained by COVID-19, no different than the Great Depression. And that's going to put a, a, a value embedded in their soul. You won't have to give them a speech anymore about why this, these, these values are important, why healthcare is important, <laughs> why government, well, stable people governments are important. Sure by now, well. Yeah. Well, thank because you so much. They'll believe, they'll believe it themselves, and that's the best advocate. In their hearts, right? In their hearts. Well, thank you so much, John Hope Bryant, for, for joining us and sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, for those of you in the audience, um, there'll be another interview next week that we're going to broadcast. And meanwhile, uh, log in to We Don't Have Time, the app, and make your voices heard. More climate action. And you can also go into a sustainabletomorrow.com if you're in Scandinavia and become a partner partner or, or become a, a part of our network. And great to be hosting this show. My name is Katarina Rolf-Stotter-Jonsson and see you soon again. Bye-bye.